Hello everyone and welcome to this course on modern application development. Okay, so now that we know different things that can, different ways in which a client can exist or can be implemented, let's take a further look at the notion of client side computation. Okay. Now, one of the major forms of client side computation that we need to perform is so called validation. Okay. Now, before I go further into what validation looks like at the client side, I want to stress upon this fact, right? Server side validation, as we discussed in an earlier lecture, is essential, right? Meaning that the last step before it actually hits the database has to have the request properly validated and to make sure that no invalid data can make it through into the SQL query or whatever, in, uh, up to the database engine, okay? But if you do perform some amount of validation on the client side, it can actually help in reducing the number of hits on the server. Of course, if somebody wants to maliciously, you know, try and cause problems for you, that's a different story. They'll just bypass your client altogether and go directly to the server and start hitting it, okay? That's not what we are talking about. We are talking about accidental mistakes or, you know, small problems here and there, right? So, for example, there are many forms that require you to fill out an email, specify some kind of a date, right? And maybe even, you know, do some kind of basic sanitization on the data, right? Now, if you could do a lot of that on the front end itself, the big advantage that would happen is that, you know, you don't even have network traffic. You are not going to go and load the server unnecessarily when you have typed in something wrong, okay? Uh, there is some amount of extra work required because now remember you have to validate both at the front end and at the back end, but it results in overall a better user experience, okay? Once again, in terms of details about this, this is a good link, right? The Mozilla Developer Network, they have a lot of information about form validation techniques and so on, right? And one of the things that can be very powerful is to use the so-called inbuilt form controls that are there in HTML5, right? So there are things where you can sort of specify that, you know, a particular, let's say a name is required, right? You can also specify a minimum length and a maximum length for certain kinds of text fields and the browser itself will validate that before passing it on to the server, right? Remember, like I said, you might specify a max length over here, but you have to once again check it at the server end because there's no guarantee that the request that the server finally got came through a particular client or th from a particular page. Okay, but like I said, this does help to cut down on sort of false alarms, right? You can do, you know, min length, max length for text fields, min max for numerics, right? Certain kinds of specific predefined types, which I'm not very sure about. There is also, in fact, this something is quite powerful, something called a regular expression pattern match, right? Now, what exactly are regular expressions? How do we use them is not something we'll be um, getting into over here but they can be used to do fairly complex pattern matching with, you know, uh, and sort of uh, seeing if the input pattern matches with various kinds of things, right? Now, one important thing to keep in mind is you might put all of this into your HTML page. Keep in mind that some older browsers may simply not support all the features, okay? And one of the questions that as a developer you then need to answer is, do you care? Okay, is backward compatibility really required? In other words, are you concerned about something where, you know, a person might still be using, uh, let's say, you know, Windows 95 PC with the appropriate browser, which was there on it? I mean, very unlikely. I mean, I don't think that even is going to be running at this point in time. But you might have, let's say, you know, some reasonably old version of Windows or Linux with a browser that does not support any of these capabilities. What do you do in such a case, right? Now, this is where frameworks help because frameworks very often take care of all of that behind the scenes, right? They sort of accommodate for the fact that you might be interested in backwards compatibility and therefore put in extra code that takes care of all of that. The obvious problem is it also makes things much slower, okay? On the other hand, apart from the input uh, validation that can be done as part of HTML5, you could also do validation with JavaScript. Right? Remember that JavaScript has access to all your forms, all your elements, right? Therefore, they also provided something called the Constraint Validation API, right? Which makes much more complex validation possible simply because you can now write a full-blown JavaScript function in order to do the validation, right? 
An example would be something like this. Let's say that I have a form, right, where I essentially have one input type, right, where I have specified that the type is email, okay. Now, what would that do? Of course, I, you know, even the fact that you have specified it as email, you could basically do some basic validation within HTML5 itself, or you could have a small piece of JavaScript code which does this. It goes to the DOM, picks out the element by ID which corresponds to mail, which is basically, you know, this ID equal to mail out here, and adds an event listener, right? which will listen for an input event on that ID. That is to say, you put something in there and press enter or whatever to submit the form, okay? And at that point, if it basically does not satisfy the validity condition that you have, right? You would basically have in a message which, you know, gives a custom uh, message back to the end user, right? I am expecting an email address, not just that, you know, wrong or something of that sort. Okay, and this is what it would look like. So if I typed in something like this into such a form and tried clicking on submit, it would pop up with a message saying, I am expecting an email address. Whereas the normal default, if I had not used this custom validity, would have been something different, whatever the browser just is going to say. Or it might even have just, you know, not shown any message, but just refused to accept that input. Okay, so JavaScript obviously also helps you to add to what you can do with validation. Now, validation is not the only thing that you can do with client-side computation. You can also do things like CAPTCHA, right? And uh, why do we need something like CAPTCHA? The basic problem that it's trying to solve is that whenever you have a web, uh, a page, right, a web page, somebody will probably try to cause problems for you, right? So they try to automate a script which will try to automatically, you know, do some things or hit the page multiple times and so on. Examples are, you know, the IRCTC for railway tatkal bookings, they have this problem where people try to write scripts which will automatically bypass everything and, you know, go through and book it before someone else can. Similarly, we also had, uh, you know, a lot of reports of applications around the time that the COVID vaccine uh, app came out saying that, you know, there were ways by which it would allow you to just do everything very fast and get the application, you know, get the appointment before it before others could do it, right? So obviously this is happening because of scripts. We want to sort of prevent that from happening and prove that you are a human in order to be able to access a given web page, right? And what are the restrictions of humans at the end of the day when I'm using a mouse and clicking, there are limits on how many clicks and how much data I can enter within a given amount of time, okay? And what things like reCAPTCHA from Google do is that it basically runs a script on the page which is sort of tracking what you are doing with the mouse, where you are going, what you are clicking on, what you are entering and so on and sort of builds up information about whether or not you are a human, okay? Which is why in many cases you might notice that, you know, the reCAPTCHA basically gives you a box. It doesn't ask you to type anything in. You just click on the box, say I am a human and, you know, it says, okay, accepted and move on, okay? Now, the reason it's doing that is it has already been tracking information about what you have been doing with the mouse, what you have been doing with keys and so on. And therefore, it has reasonable confidence that yes, you are actually a human who is using this. And if it has a doubt, of course, you know, it will put up some pictures of traffic lights or uh, dogs or cats and ask you to, you know, select them so that you can then continue to the next phase, right? So, that's one potential use for JavaScript, the fact that it can track a lot of information, right? But potentially that's also concerning, right? The fact that the script is able to keep track of so much about you, enough to decide whether or not you are a human, should be a little bit worrying, but anyway, we are used to it now. What else can you do with client-side computation? Pretty much anything. And in fact, there are cases where people have even written scripts that do crypto mining, right? So Bitcoin, things of that sort, try and run it. Now, what's cool about this is that basically now all that you need to do is put it up on your web page and anybody visiting that web page is now going to start running a crypto mining algorithm on their machine. It's not on your server, right? Now, obviously this is frowned upon and whenever this is seen, right, people take active steps to make sure that those scripts are taken out. So it's definitely not advisable. It can get you seriously blacklisted and in a lot of trouble, right? It's considered at the same level as trying to sort of, you know, crack into servers. So it's to be avoided, but the point is that you can do lots of interesting things, okay? 
and of course the reason why all this happens is that modern javascript engines are really powerful right they are able almost to run at the full speed of the underlying processor which is very very fast okay and in a lot of cases they can even access the system gpus and thereby get access to really high performance computation okay and what happens in such a case is that you know there is a simple page that loads runs a javascript script right and that script will in turn do some computation and make calls to an external server in order to send data back through asynchronous calls in the background okay the client may not even be aware that all this is running okay so the point is all of this is also something that can be done as part of client side computation not necessarily a good thing but you know it's possible so finally we come to the security implications of all of this right so you have a full blown language now running in your browser front end what does that mean right uh there's a big question to be asked should javascript be run automatically on every page and if you answer yes great because it provides a lot of additional capabilities and can make your user experience a lot better on in many ways but you might also say no simply because you know uh what if that page now tries to load local files and somehow send them out to a server which does not have any business seeing those local files right i don't want my documents to be just sent out to someone else right so there a concept called sandboxing is used which basically provides a secure area that the javascript engine has access to so you know the javascript engine is limited to the sandbox right it can't access anything outside of that in particular it cannot access files it cannot access network resources local storage nothing of that sort because all of those are outside the sandbox so it's similar to a sort of restricted virtual machine but at a higher level right it's basically run in the javascript interpreter and not at the sort of machine instruction level now that still means that you know there are ways in which you can cause problems for the client right and or not just for the client even for certain servers right one of the things that has been done in the past is potentially you know take a simple uh some kind of a popular javascript file somewhere and replace it with a bad version okay now the problem with this bad version is that maybe you know it even behaves normally most of the time but under some specific conditions it will start generating requests to one central server okay so now just imagine that this is a popular javascript file it's been loaded onto the web pages of you know thousands or even millions of people around the world and at some specific point in time all of those machines right as long as the person is browsing a page that has that javascript loaded suddenly start generating requests to apple.com right or some website okay that server is most likely going to go down under what's called a denial of service attack right it's just hit by so many requests that it has to stop responding to any of them and wait for whatever you know this entire thing to subside okay so denial of service is potentially possible you could also do the opposite which is that you might you know run something which runs on the client and uses up so much resources of the client that it's difficult to even navigate away from that page or close the browser okay once again the client's machine becomes unusable okay so all of those are possible javascript engines typically have a lot of safeguards in them to prevent things of that sort from happening so you know it's more likely that you will get a message saying look this page is using too many resources should we kill it right rather than sort of just hanging the entire system but there might be ways especially if there are bugs or something that are unknown to the user that can actually cause problems okay and the other big question as far as security is concerned is of course access to native resources right should a javascript uh, application be allowed to access native resources can it be used in order to write native like applications okay if you can allow access to you know local sensors for example the tilt sensor cameras magnetometers and so on or local storage you can actually create very nice applications that are completely web based and run in your browser right the and in a lot of cases what happens usually for something like this is that it has to be explicitly permitted by the user and then it will be sort of installed locally onto your system 
in such a way that you know the user is aware of the fact that yes this is a locally installed thing that's running it's you know you have to trust it at some level but that's you know you're trusting it just about as much as any program that you download from the internet and run okay it is also possible to sort of compile directly down into native resources which means that it will use the apis of the underlying operating system okay in such a case you can have even smoother interaction with the system and potentially you know better i mean reduce browser overheads even further so to summarize all of this talk about the front end and javascript right the front end experience is determined to a large extent by browser capabilities right the basic HTML plus CSS based rendering, you know, uh, the CSS takes care of styling, the HTML takes care of the content, right? That can be enhanced quite significantly by having some level of scripting, right? Which is usually provided today by JavaScript, right? So JavaScript or client side scripting can uh, make for a much better user experience and also open up possibilities that might be very difficult to do with only pure HTML and CSS for the simple reason that JavaScript is a full-blown programming language, right, sitting on the client side. Potentially very serious security implications that you need to be aware of as a developer, right? And of course, th the last thing that bears repetition, so I'm going to say it again and again, is no matter what validation you might do in your JavaScript or at the front end, you always have to make sure you are doing it once again at the back end, right? The server, in other words, should any time a server is written using web technologies, it means that it can receive an HTTP request that could potentially be from anywhere, which means that it cannot assume anything about the state of the client or the nature of the client and has to be ready to do the validation once again on its own before it allows the data or the request to go through into the database.